Welcome again to our October Stretch 2.0 Cohort Practical Application Workshop. My name is Dorothy Evans, a Senior Program Officer with the CDC Foundation. Very happy to be with you all today. Um, here we go. Um, today, we will start off uh, with some uh, few announcements for you all, and then um, we have um, our colleagues from ASTO presenting on how does boundary spanning practices impact health equity? And then we'll wrap up with our um, practical application workshop evaluation. Um, so if possible, please uh, join us by video and mute your line when you're not speaking. Uh, for the purposes of our um, evaluation, we do ask that you add your um, two a letter state abbreviation to your name in Zoom. And so I have an example here on the screen, um, Dorothy Evans, comma, M-O, and I will rename myself here in a moment. Um, the way that you do that is you hover over um, your either your name or your um, video feed, and you click on the um, the burger or the, the three little dots in the upper right-hand corner that will allow you to rename yourself um, uh, to add your two-letter abbreviation. Um, please feel free to use the chat function to add your questions or comments, and then we are recording um, this meeting. Um, we will have breakout sessions, uh, but those will not be recorded. Uh, so quick announcements and reminders before I turn it over to our colleagues at ASTO. Um, we do have a change in um, CDC Foundation point of contact. Um, our uh, dear and lovely colleague, Aaron Salvaggio, has accepted a um, position with the task force for global health. So um, she is no longer with us um, supporting the stretch uh, initiative. Um, so I will serve as your main point of contact um, for uh, things related to um, reporting, invoicing and logistics for our uh, summit. Um, and uh, the next uh, reminder that I have for you all is this is for our collaborative leads. Um, we do have a report coming up that is the vignette report. Um, and the vignette is going to be due November 22nd. So I am hosting a few office hours where um, you can drop in and ask any questions about developing the one pager um, or uh, any other questions that you might have related to budget um, or invoicing. Um, and those are Wednesday, October 30th from three to four ET and Wednesday, November 6th from three to four ET. Um, we did send out the calendar invite, but please contact me if you did not receive or if you want to connect at another time, uh, I'm happy to, to schedule um, uh, other uh, uh, sessions with you. Uh, and then the final one is um, related to the public health infrastructure grant. So um, you may recall during one of these calls, we kind of asked um, if anyone has heard of FIG. Um, and that was because one of our goals for the stretch initiative was to connect um, our stretch health department representatives with their state's public health infrastructure grant point of contact. Um, and so um, just a little bit about FIG. FIG is a groundbreaking investment from CDC supporting critical public health infrastructure needs across the US. And so um, the gives health departments the flexibility to direct funds towards specific organizational and community needs that strengthen public health outcomes. So really the purpose for us um, connecting um, stretch with FIG is for uh, the health department um, colleagues uh, to develop relationships and explore potential areas for future collaboration and sustainability through FIG. So um, in the next few weeks, CDC colleagues um, that are supporting the FIG initiative will be reaching out to the state health representatives um, to facilitate those introductions between um, the health department representatives and the, and FIG. And so we do see this as an important strategy and opportunity to raise up each state's stretch health equity work and connect them with the broader public health infrastructure work happening in the state. So um, that um, will be coming. And then um, a few more um, before I pass it over. Um, so uh, for this first one, um, we continue to encourage you all to access technical assistance through our Practical Application Workshop partner partners, uh, Frameworks, Ovation, and Georgia Health Policy Center. Um, we're glad to hear that, that some folks are already starting to make these connections. Um, and again, um, these partners are really here to assist you with framing communications um, and addressing your finance and, and sustainability um, goals. And so there is a TA one pager that outlines the available TA and the process for requesting TA that's posted to the SharePoint site. 
Um, the next announcement is about journey mapping. Uh, so your collaboratives will be receiving a journey mapping reflection form two weeks prior to your core team meetings, and you have one week to complete and submit the form. Uh, and so during your monthly meeting, your core team members will discuss your reflections with you. Um, and so uh, the key insights from these journey maps will identify what aspects of stretch project supported teams uh, in advancing your, your equity focused systems change work and as well as what um, contextual factors and conditions um, uh, that impacted the progress along the way. And you know, overall the end product will be that each one of your collaboratives um, will have your own journey map that, that communicates your journey. So um, we uh, are really excited um, to, to see um, this process moving forward. Um, and celebrating the journey maps um, with you all at the end of the project. And last one is um, our next newsletter for the cohort is coming out November 7th. So please keep your eye out on that. And um, I do just want to reference our um, uh, six conditions of systems change um, model from the um, from FSG. So um, in the past three sessions, past three months, we have been working with Frameworks Institute. Um, addressing mental models, mental models, and looking at um, the transformative change. So now we're kind of moving up the model, um, and uh, these next three sessions um, are going to be exploring relational change, um, and so that's relationships and connections um, and power dynamics. And so with that, I will stop sharing, and I will pass it over um, to Valerie Henderson uh, for the next part. Thank you, Dorothy. And then we'll go ahead and yep, enable screen sharing. Um, hello, everyone. Good to see you all again in space. Um, welcome to the fourth uh, Practical Application Workshop. Uh, today, we'll be talking about how does boundary spanning practices impact health equity with Dr. Um, Alice Chanel. Really excited to have her here in space with us from ESTO. Um, next slide, please. So the purpose and objectives, why are we here? One, it is to define the five types of boundaries. So um, you all will or should have received um, some pre-work, uh, if you will, of the different types of boundaries. So we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into that and figure out how it links to your structure and your roles within your organization. We're going to identify leadership roles, relationships, and conditions that amplify the importance of these influence, influencers of systems change. So also including the FSG model that we always reference in our stretch framework. And then lastly is to describe strategies to remove boundaries, to develop relationships, connections, and power dynamics that lead to long lasting uh, system and relational change. Next slide. And with that, uh, we will go into the group engagement. So obviously we want you all to share as much as you're comfortable. So take space, make space for other ideas, thought processes, exercise a growth mindset. So we're here to learn, we're here to take things um, and apply them hopefully to our own work. Let your experience be a rank. So not just your years in the field, but your uh, lived experience. We want that to be something that you, if you feel comfortable, that you can share. And then also maintain confidentiality. So we want to take the lessons, stories, stay. Uh, we will have some opportunity to do breakouts and you all will be able to connect with your fellow uh, cohort. Um, so making sure we just maintain that confidentiality, practice full presence and engagement. So as Dorothy mentioned, if you are available to um, have that camera on, we would love to have that camera on, especially in the breakout rooms. If not, um, please feel free to mute yourself when you're not speaking and then use the chat as well. Um, with that, I know that's a very long list of engagement, but are there any others that we want to highlight? All righty, next slide, please. And then with that, we will go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Chanel to get us started with some challenge questions. Dr. Chanel. Hey, greetings, everyone. Uh, as stated, I am Dr. Alice Chanel, and I bring you greetings from ASTO. 
where I serve as the Director of Cross-Sector Leadership and Facilitation. So let's kick it off with having a conversation. Uh, I, I love to talk, but I like to um, have a call and response. So um, when thinking about boundaries, what what happens on the inside of you when you're thinking about like um, there's something that you need to navigate that requires energy that you just don't have or you're like unwilling to invest? I'm going to get one or two people to come off and just kind of share what that's like from a human centered pers perspective. Don't even think about equity, just in general. Holidays coming up. You got a family that likes to cross boundaries. <laughs> How are you going to show up in the space? <laughs> Anybody that that chuckled to me warrants uh, a comment. <laughs> uh, safety. Okay. Anybody else? Just want to mention what that's like for you? I would say on the other side, overwhelm, not not being okay. able to hold those boundaries, especially with people uh, that you're um, especially sensitive to okay. um, and, and don't want to potentially harm the relationship mm. or what you might perceive as potentially harming the relationship. So mm. you stretch your boundaries and can be overwhelmed. Very nice, Carrie. I like the fact that you're willing to stretch, although um, it's difficult. Anyone else want to chime in when you first think about boundaries? What happens for you? Alice. Yes. Dr. Chanel. Dr. Yes. Chanel, hello. Yes. Um, <laughs> hello. I have a really hard time modulating, right? Mm. I have two, two go-tos. Either is complete avoidance mm. or just guns a blazing right? Ooh, wow. so, right and and I really try to never go to the second thing and so a lot of times I'm just avoid but then mm -hmm. you know what happens because I have that energy to um, confront it gets resentment and all mm -hmm. sorts of you know when I internalize it it's also not healthy absolutely and thank you for adding that um I want to submit to um, each of you that, you know, not only is it human, but um, when we layer it with the work that we are embarking upon together right now for what, over a year now or close to a year, I'm not sure if you were, all of you were, in, I know that all of you were not in um, cohort one, but um, when you layer just navigating boundaries, not being uh, a simple task, right? That it takes energy, it takes work. Um, and I love what was stated by the person from Vermont, when you don't want to harm a relationship, um, it's difficult. And then when you layer this work around equity, health equity, and operationalizing it, and um, moving from the discussion to, you know, really applying it and advocacy and all these different ways that we approach our work, um, it's probably even more difficult because we're not sure. But the importance of what we want to discuss today is, um, one, just how do you think, um, to Philip's point, um, working um, or to boost your uh, boundary spanning ability will help you? What do you hope um, if you, by the end of uh, today, at five o'clock, uh, my time, Eastern Standard, what do you hope to accomplish? And then the next question, you can use the chat, you can come off. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. It's just, just kind of um, priming the the pump of what if or imagine that you can make one commitment to yourself that you're going to operate or navigate around boundaries differently by the end of this session. And so we can all do that together. Um, and then the second question is, what is the challenge you face working across boundaries? What would be different about you if you could better work across boundaries? And we're framing this in the uh, equity space, the health equity space, that is. And then last but not least, why is boundary spanning uh, important for you uh, in your community that you represent um, personally, you know, like your personal brand? And then from a public health career perspective, 
um, how do you want to land your plane or you want to um, add to who you are in your, your own posture, your own resume, um, your own voice in a community or at a table um, by being able to work across boundaries. So I'd love to have one or two people to comment and then we will or add to the chat and then we'll jump, we'll jump in and have some conversation here. And you don't have to respond to all. You can just, one of the questions, um, um, what is a challenge that you face when you're working across boundaries? What would be different? Yes. Hi, this is Danielle. I think, um, I don't know, specifically thinking about boundaries, but as you're talking, I keep thinking about um, a challenge I have and really trying to show vulnerability in the sense of it not being weakness. Um, I think about when we, a lot of times having these conversations, you know, I, um, you know, I get met with maybe defensiveness. So I'm trying to think about how do I show vulnerability and flexibility and grace in the way that it's not seen as weakness, but seen as an opportunity um, mm. just to kind of grow together. Okay. So that's along the lines of, of, of what Philip is saying as well, right? Or is that happy in um, medium <laughs> to keep things moving? Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? Sure, I'll chime in. I will. Oh, go ahead, Dory. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I was okay. just I was just going to say boundaries are sometimes with communication and accessibility um, for individuals and how we communicate and um, knowing everyone's communication styles and if they need support or accommodations. For that communication, that could be crossing different people's boundaries and making sure everyone feels comfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely, Dory. Thank you. Uh, is it Sunk? Sunk? Did I get it right? Sunk. That's Sunk Sunk close. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Ellis. Um, yeah, I think um, the challenge is. Um, Anytime you try, to, one tries to um, work across the boundaries, there's a, a a a chance of being misunderstood, um, and there's a miscommunication, and um, so the challenge is how how do we work across that boundary and be heard effectively? rather than um in interpreting interpreting what one might hear yeah something like that yeah that is not personal yes that absolutely. is not personal thanks That's for what, that absolutely which is why the systems change is so vitally important that's what we're trying to shift right shift culture and and the system so all right well, thank you so much. And again, I, I don't have a magic wand to say, hey, this is an algorithm for becoming a boundary spanning champion. However, today we will spend time um, talking about not only what, what it is, but uh, why sometimes it's challenging. And then we will move to identifying some common areas. After that, we will um, come back together and um ground ourselves in how we might be able to do it and I'll whet your appetite and we'll talk about how might you um, engage even more if, if that would be helpful for you. So the first I want to start with boundary spanning leadership. I want to first level set us with what I mean when I say leadership. Uh, I am not talking about a formal position or power but what I am talking about is an individual, a person, regardless of where they sit on the O chart, that has the capacity to create direction, alignment, and commitment. Because that person, whoever you are in the room, is a boundary spanning leader. And the goal of being a boundary spanning leader is to reach the higher goals, to reach the vision that's bigger than what we can accomplish alone. And we know that the work that we are undertaking now that's why we have a collaborative, um, requires a lot of actors in our system. And those actors are sometimes in formal positions of, a, of power and authority. And then some of them may not even have a, uh, a reading level above fifth grade. 
but they are a stakeholder and they have an invested interest in seeing things be better in their communities. So this is the official definition of boundary spanning leadership. The capability, the capacity, uh, the courage to pull people together and have direction, alignment, and commitment. I call it DAC sometimes for short. But what do I mean when I say direction, alignment, and commitment? First, it's really simple. Direction is where are we going? Where are we going? What is our goal? How do we define? What is equity in this um, domain of work that we've chosen um, to adopt and move forward, right? So where are we going? What is the end goal? What is the product? What are we communicating as one voice? The second is, how do we get there? Whose roles or responsibilities are at play now? Who's on, who's activated to be a part of this movement? And then last is the mutual responsibility for the entire group. Who's committed to the work? Regardless of where you sit on the project team for this health equity project, the question is whether you're at 20%, 30%, staying committed and at the table. All three must be present in order to achieve the goal, as you can imagine. And so when one is missing, the impact is on the other two arenas. And I will say by far that alignment is the hardest. And I also say this is not a destination. Every time you engage a new community partner or a new part of the, even the um, health department, a new, maybe it's the IT area because you need support there. And it's just an exa example. But every time you activate a new part uh, or a new party or actor in your system, that warrants the, needs to, the need to realign the direction, the alignment, and the commitment. So it is not for sure a destination. It's a journey. When we have uh, high uh, levels of DAC, this present DAC, again, is direction, alignment, and commitment. Um, it's because we're getting not everything right, but we're revisiting it. We're making sure. Sometimes that's the that's the swim lane for those of you with a quality improvement background or the racy chart, or it is um, just looking at the, the minutes and the, the, the constitution that you put together. The, 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 I say constitution, that's too strong of a document, but whatever the program plan that you put together. Um, just making sure that you revisit that because things change and sometimes it's the undocumented or the unspoken that gets us um, to shift in our level of commitment because we notice it and no one's talking about it. So with direction, um, direction can be really weak when the um, the, clear, the the clarity around where people are going and when it changes or shifts, it's not discussed and there's disagreement about it. And there's also resistance. When there's resistance, again, that's not personal. It is clearly because people are unsure. So they're just kind of pushing back and saying, well, we said this, but we're doing this. Again, not personal, just a, an opportunity to come together and have that conversation again. The second is alignment. I mentioned earlier that alignment is a little bit harder. Um, it's because it requires strong coordination, uh, lots of communication in multiple ways. Uh, it also um, can be really uh, impacted by structures being weak, not having enough people or the right people at the table. And then accountability and responsibilities are unclear. Who's doing what, when, and how? And last, um, the low motivation for coordination can also, because sometimes the goal can be so uh, around where you want to go with this work, can be so front and center, we um, sometimes needing to slow down and build some infrastructure to ensure that we're able to move forward together. Commitment is, again, uh, the, the last of the three, but it's almost like a byproduct of having clear direction and strong commitments around um, who's doing what, which is the alignment. Um, when people are not feeling um, responsible because they're not sure what their role or agency um, plays on your project and you've invited them to the table, then they're probably not going to show up as often um, as they did in the beginning. And then when they don't see themselves as a part of the group, meaning their organization having a real role or what 
is in it for them. And then members don't feel included or valued by whatever um, means that could be, like what service area or service line that they um, represent in the project, but they don't see that people are valuing that. They don't see where it's truly being integrated. That causes people to kind of pause and slow down. And the other part is you're going to always have someone that is more interested or self-interested in how they can um, promote themselves in their own work. That's going to always be present at some point or to some degree in a program or project area. But when it comes to equity and people are needing to have direction, alignment, and commitment, we're not talking about people as individuals. We're talking about coming together as teams. So this is DAC. This is the core of what is required to navigate boundaries. DAC. If you don't remember anything else, remember that direction, alignment, and commitment for a greater vision or goal that you cannot solve, that you've already identified in your um, scope of work for this project, that you can't do it in one solo agency and definitely not one person. So again, we're talking about the system, the table, the um, movement, the group, the collaborative, whatever you name yourself, when you're representing, um, facing the community, external facing, um, we need the presence of DAC. Now, um, we, we recognize that DAC doesn't just happen, that you have to work at it. And that's where we want to begin to talk about the, the types of boundaries. This is not exhaustive, but this is to offer you some common areas that boundaries not only show up and are persistent and will rob you of your performance or your impact in your community. If we are unable to pull these uh, these boundaries, make them present, uh, name what it is, and then intentionally working to either expand them. And I recognize also that some boundaries we have to protect because we have, a, um, we're public health, right? We're working for a greater good to improve the population's health, to create equity, right? That everyone can have an opportunity to have optimal health the way they define it and would like to see and have it and experience it. So that being the case, um, we recognize that these boundaries are present in various ways. Sometimes it's vertical. These are the five organizational types of boundaries that are often present or they're common in any type of organization, whether it's a health department, a primary care clinic, a hospital. And guess what? Even if we weren't talking about equity, we still would find these boundaries present. And some are more frequent than others, but vertical is one. And that's how we navigate levels of authority. And so to Philip's point, I can pick on Philip. He's my buddy. He's my friend. But to Philip's point, uh, I would probably uh, think twice about how I navigated a vertical boundary so that I could protect my job, maybe as an example, right? And then there is horizontal. That's working across. So just, those are the different um, areas of functions and expertise operating in the organization or on your project, right? So you might have grants, you might have IT, you might have a community partner that represents one part of the project. You may have communications, maybe um, some type of TV, television program or social media platform. There's so many different areas that we require in order to function as one voice. So that's horizontal boundaries. And then there's stakeholder boundaries. This is internal as well as external. When we're looking at, sorry about that. When we're looking at external boundaries, um, we're talking about the community. We're talking about the different partners and actors operating in the system that requires a change in order to see greater outcomes, better outcomes. But internally, we also have stakeholders because we, when we look at the different functions and expertise that are operating in the system, then we also think about how they need to understand, have some level of understanding, respect, and appreciation for what we're trying to get done. And then we look at demographics. Demographics are the people uh, representing. Um, I remember I'm, I'm remembering a person just chiming in. I think it may have been Dory saying, like, we want to make sure that people that have uh, specific needs around access, whether it is language, whether it is um, sound, whatever that looks like. 
whatever the needs are, we want to make sure that um, we are acknowledging those. So demographics would not only speak to uh, looking at um, the boxes we check, but we're talking about the different ways people communicate and would like to be communicated to, um, to ensure that everybody's on the same page. And so last but not least is geographic. Um, some of you represent local municipalities or, or county level or regional level. And so when we have boundaries that are different in one municipality versus another, uh, that also can put present what I would consider a need to just kind of slow down and understand better how might we serve everyone, even though, even though they may not be, a, we may not be able to serve them the same. So these are the five types of boundaries that are common and they're persistent. If I could give you an easy way to think about boundaries, think about your health department, your community-based organization as a house. In the house, there's ceilings, and there are floors with the ceilings and the floors that represents the vertical boundaries. And then there are walls and the walls represents the horizontal boundaries. When you look at stakeholders, those are the people in the house and the people that visit the house and the people that the house is meant to serve. When you look at the demographic boundaries, um, those are the people in, in the house, right? I meant to say stakeholder would be the windows and the doors, all right? And then demographic would represent the people. And when you walk outside of the house, that's geographic, meaning whoever is uh, considered a part of the community and then the community that you create that are across different uh, lanes based on um zip codes, uh, it can be based on um, how you are able to bring people into your space using technology. And so there's various ways that we can be diverse in our geographic um, and boundaries. So when I talk about the boundaries, I wanna make sure that we, we level set where we are with uh, what's happening. So when we think about like some of the work that's happening in the collaboratives, like accessibility, when we think about accessibility, we have to think about who um, is able to control or to influence or remove barriers around creating equity around accessibility. Oftentimes, we often look first at um, who's in positions of power or authority to get that done, right? And so when we look at horizontal, we think about the different areas. Is it an academic partner? Is it a civic organization? Is it the private entity, a private entity that are able to help us be able to um, reach the goals? And um, they too um, would also have the same um, interest, which would be to provide equity, not only in that geographical area, but in within their own sector. So working across sectors is vitally important and vitally is really powerful when you can have that collective impact across the different sectors. And then from stakeholders, um, collaborating um, um, efforts to secure funding to meet the equity object objectives. Who can help pay for it? Bottom line, if it's everybody's business, which health is, public health is everybody's business. If the public didn't figure that out during COVID, the public will never, ever know that, right? That everyone not only has a part to play, a hand in it, but everybody is at um, is benefiting from having public health as a part of their community structure. And then there's demographics, right? Who are the payers, the people, and the providers that are also um, interested, invested, and willing to be a, a partner, a part of that DAC moving it forward? And so looking at specific um, issues as it relates to maternal and child health, um, specifically uh, maternal and child health um, among the Black community, and looking at the LGBTQ plus um, accessibility to equity uh, around health care and health care this um that's just right and right size for the population that is in need and again geographic uh, we've got some really cool things going on that i've been able to only hear about because i haven't been very close to what you're doing but i'm um, on local levels to look and um zoom in to say what's happening as it relates to black health in our own county so these are the boundaries. Thank you, Valerie, for dropping those in. Before we move to a breakout to start to have some conversations around the types of boundaries, my question for you is, and I'll drop the screen for now, um, 
How do you feel about the different types of boundaries that were just named? When I say, how do you feel, um, when you're thinking about the work that you're leading right now around not only dri you're driving change, right? Change is hard in and of itself, but we're driving change around a topic that sometimes people, if not clearly defined, move into some areas and domains of thinking and, and pushing back that are, are unnecessary, right? Unnecessary means if we calculate it, meaning financially, and understand how the community benefits when everyone have access to and can um, have what they define as optimal health, then we all win, right? And so when you're thinking about boundaries that you're facing right now in your project areas, um, what, come, what comes up for you? What comes up for you? Any thoughts before we move into breakout? Well, this is what we're going to do in the breakout. Why are you still mulling over this? Because I talked for a long time, I feel like. I want you to spend a little bit of time, like the next 30 to thirty to 60 seconds, thinking about those five types of boundaries. Um, Valerie's dropped the flyer in the chat. And I want, to, I want you to think about in your scope of what you're doing right now in your equity work, um, what's really difficult for you to navigate? What or which of the boundaries really is hard for you to navigate, it's difficult. And then I want you to think about um, what's fairly, nothing is easy, I get it in the work, right? But um, it's easy in the sense that you're doing pretty well at navigating that boundary and stretching it and spanning it that you might be able, you're seeing some light in that tunnel, right? Or are you seeing um, some progress is a better way to frame it. So as you think about that, when you break into your groups, you're going to get about 10 to 15 minutes, about 15 minutes. If I stop talking, it's, it's going to be 12 minutes, right? But you're going to have some time to have a conversation and share what's difficult for you and what's working well for you in terms of it's a boundary and you acknowledge that, but you're navigating it and you're getting, you're, you're, you're making strides. And then um, come back together. Any ideas around what you, uh, you'd be willing to share and feel comfortable sharing around how you're getting that done or how might you get it done? If it's the difficult that you have, you're having this discussions about when you come back to the main space we'll we'll continue and have you share a high level of what you were able to discuss so it's time for breakout we'll ask that um if we could get about um i stole three of your minutes so i'll say 13 minutes in the breakout welcome back everyone welcome back yay return to the space hello 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 as you re into the room um there was, I do believe, four rooms. So could I get maybe about a minute from each room or 30 seconds of high level? What 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 are some ahas or takeaways that you are gained in your space together? The chat is open and or you can come off mute. What kind of conversations were you able to have? I'll jump in and start for group four and um, feel free. I was with uh, Misty and Sean, so feel free uh, to jump in team. Um, we kind of talked about, well, first, um, I couldn't get the document to open. So uh, I'm, I'd like to say that we may um, just knowing we'll, if we're accurate in. So we mentioned some of the challenges, um, not so much with like community organizations and it kind of resonated like peer to peer or within the organization and thinking about um, I know I mentioned like thought we were all on the same journey and have the same mission and then come to find out, well, maybe not. <laughs> um, so that is, you know, kind of a challenge and a struggle. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about kind of sometimes the voice of um, one or a smaller being louder than the collective um, and kind of the challenges that we experienced there. Um, and sometimes either uh, like uh, Phil was saying either just being quiet or, you know, guns blazing and like, how do we kind of meet that in the middle? Um, apologize for the violent reference, sorry. That's a, okay. I hear you, thank you. Uh, who else would like to share? I think we were group three. Um, okay. One of the things we talked about in the types of boundaries was horizontal. Um, mm -hmm. I chose that as my easiest one. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the importance of building relationships with the peers across the system. Um, uh, the example that I used 
was my time in the military, a lot of what we did or asks that we had, you'd send emails and it would either happen or it wouldn't. But one of the things that I learned was if you took that 15 or 20 minutes to walk down to their office, talk to them for a little bit, talk story like we do over here in Hawaii, um, the better, all right, man, what do you need? And you could, you know, you have your ask. And that's one of the things that I'm very fortunate to be able to do over here as well um, with the early childhood systems is have those conversations, develop those relationships. So that way, if a university needs something, they can ask me if I have the question, I can ask them, you know, if early intervention needs something, they have no problem calling and talking, um, you know, trying to open up the silos and maybe make one big dome or something. But yeah. Thank you. So I hear Danielle saying in your room, the discussion was around uh, just having agreement on where you're going and how you're going to get there when in one voice. And I also hear and and when it's not one voice, how do you balance keeping the relationship and still yet addressing important issues? And then Jonathan, relationship is everything. Snaps. Next, anybody else? Another group? Want to either use the chat or come off really quick? Right. Carolyn, do you want to go for our we were uh, room number one? Okay. Sure. Um, we were talking about, um, I think it probably lands under the horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, just the, well, the most recent thing that we talked about was really um, giving other people the permission to act. Uh, and so we each shared a story about um, how that has worked out, you know, one picking up trash uh, mm -hmm. and then others followed. And um, in my town, we have an issue with folks um, not being super happy about sharps being left and sort of um, being really judgmental of, of who's leaving them and, and that sort of thing. Um, and how as the Northeast Prevention Coalition, we decided that we would just, you know, do what we could and plan a pickup um, and it's gotten a lot of interest from folks. So, you know, just the giving other people permission to act is, um, a lot of what we talked about. And did you want to add anything, Christina? That, um, uh, yeah, so I think two things, other things that we talked about was, um, data, that data mm -hmm. that maybe someone at a higher level will say wants to collect around mm -hmm. the issue is mm -hmm. not very sexy to the people that are actually, you know, uh, on the ground. So in mm -hmm. other words, Carolyn's talking about the trash, you know, picking up the trash, for example. And uh, when people see the trash is picked up, that has more value than some data, you uh -huh. know, right there. So it's really important that those kinds of data points are just as valuable, if not more valuable sometimes. Um, yeah. And we need to be cognizant of that. Um, and allow a community, whatever mm -hmm. community that is, to kind of figure out what data works for them. Another is that um, on the vertical, um, my ex experience of working with community work, which I've done for a long time, is that uh, we have I've learned to have conversations way up front mm -hmm. that I used to never have way up front because okay. I was scared. Okay. Gotcha. About gotcha. Um, about this is collaborative mm -hmm. and you and the value of everybody's voice is mm -hmm. the same but we know that many leaders are expected to have answers and we're not expecting them to have answers and that needs to have a conversation way early that it's mm -hmm. sometimes we really just need you to shut up oh you know, right. with, like, you know what I mean? right. just like right. just need you to be quiet and let other people talk and it's okay. That's gotcha. what we want. Gotcha. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. And I'm going to ask people to continue to, to add to the chat. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, don't want to go over. So I want to just kind of mention a few tools that might help with navigating those boundaries that you identified in, in your room. Um, one is when managing boundaries, uh, being sure that, first of all, making um, the boundaries that are being protected, that they're explicit you know, making them visible. 
And so that's identifying the actors in the system, the organizations, and where they're, you know, where they are, what they expect coming to that table. And then like some type of project charter that, you know, again, making things explicit around why people are there, what they're expecting, how are they showing up in their equity lens? And just, again, making things explicit. Uh, that speaks also to even the mental models that, um, you know, even their attitudes and perceptions around um, what the collective, what are you agreeing on in terms of direction? But forging common ground is a, a second um, um, step. And the gentleman that um, from Hawaii just mentioned uh, that stories, uh, making sure that we we get those. We know we know uh, again the story behind why people are showing up or what it is that they hope to build from. And so, and then creating that one voice to your point, Christina, about um, where you want to go and and whose voice is present or whose voice is it present. And some of that can happen through. Through mapping, uh, process mapping. I know you, you know, you're having journey mapping as a part of your experience, and even stakeholder mapping, and allowing the stories to come out of that, to grow out of that, um, in understanding where they've been and where they want to go, and then discovering new frontiers. Which takes it takes a couple of years, right? It takes relationship building. So that's reengaging. Um, over and over, even when you get upset, but coming back to the table with, um, you know, understanding what the strengths of each partner organization or person represented, as well as the assets, opportunities um, that uh, the team brings collectively. And the other I'll share is, uh, again, boundary spanning leadership is being utilized in a lot of areas in uh, throughout ASTO. Um, this is a map showing uh, other areas in the, all of our equity work. We've been able to embed uh, this as a practice to help work better together. And then we're also using it for other areas such as um, healthcare associated infections, um, preparedness, environmental health, um, business process improvement. And so we're using this particular uh, direction alignment and commitment framework to um, do work together in public health across a lot of lanes of work. The last I'll share with you, then I'll turn it back to Valerie, is that um, we do have a boundary spanning page. If you want to read more stories around how um, we're seeing um, cross-sector and cross-sector cross organizations as well as uh, uh, cross-sector efforts and cross-cutting um, teams build uh, their programmatic work out by not only in equity, but by in being intentional about building that relationship and a container together. You can um, take a look at that. And if you have any interest in going further in this conversation, utilizing this tool, unpacking it, um, reach out to your core team. I'll turn it back over to you, Valerie. Thank you, Alice. Thank you so much, Alice, for that presentation. Um, yes, if you all are looking for additional TA around uh, boundary spanning leadership or the DAC direction alignment for commitment, um, please reach out to your core team leads and we can facilitate um, that connection with Dr. Chanel. Um, and then, Dorothy, is there anything that you would like to close us out with? Yes, thanks. I just popped the um, evaluation uh, in the chat. So if you have a moment to complete it now, um, please do so. If not, um, I think um, I'll download the participant list and just email it um, to you all because, um, you know, we recognize that that we're at time. So um, please be on the lookout for a separate email. Um, I know we don't usually send separate emails, but I will send um, the link to you all. So um, you can uh, provide your feedback to us. Um, we do really um, look at it um, and we do appreciate all the, all the feedback that we get because um, we're continuing to work to, to improve um, these practical application workshops for you all. So thank you all again so much. Thank you, um, Dr. Alice Chanel. Thank you, Valerie uh, Henderson and um, to everyone that supported today. Hope you all have uh, a nice afternoon and we will see you on November 21st for our next workshop. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye.